wonderful way to make a living um, advancing arts for thousands of young people. So in addition to that, I will tell you that my background includes uh, years and years and years of making things happen for other people. I have been a teacher, I have been a leader of a vocal jazz ensemble, I, I have written um, materials for Warner Brothers compositions and uh, textbooks, all of that. Fast forward to last spring, I want to tell you about a project that I co-led with Spotify that started last spring. It's called the Equal Studio Residency, EQL, and it has benefited not only the lives of the recipients, but it has benefited the lives of persons on the ground at recording studios. It has changed the lives of the women department chairs on campus and my life. How so? All right, here we are. Um, I had worked with Spotify for years on this thing called Spotify for Education. That project ended. I, I went to New York and said, is there a new opportunity for us? And by the time I left, Berkeley received a $100,000 grant. We created the Equal Studio Residency that put women in recordio studios in Nashville, New York, and London. Six month paid experiences. But here's the magic. Putting a woman in a recording studio to have this residency, fantastic. But if she's the only woman in the building, not fantastic. So, uh, so the magic of this program is to take the studio experience and partner it with a mentorship program. So all of the women department chairs and I mentored the three recipients over the course of the six month period. So I'm talking about the woman chair of songwriting, film scoring, music business management, the women, woman chair of the guitar department, of the liberal arts department, of the music therapy department, you get the idea. So when, you, when we put all of those women in the same room, we talk to students all the time individually, but my colleagues had never heard each other give advice. They had never heard each other give advice to a young professional. So, so they grew as, as arts leaders. The three women uh, had incredible experiences. They were at... Um, Secret Genius Studio in Nashville, they were at Metropolis in London, and Spotify and Electric Lady in New York. The these experience culminated with a final project that involved Evie Queen and a reimagined recording of one of her reggaeton anthems that was released on International Women's Day that was uh, that touched and created by the three re residents, so everybody came to, to New York to be part of the project. We are now talking about EQL 2.0, and we're trying to figure out which cities. As you might imagine, now there's some more interest from other places across the country, but we're hoping that the application will go live like in a month, maybe, le or less, so that the residency will begin at the end of, of the summer and carry for another six months. So I'm looking for everyone in this room to help us find three incredible recipients to, to be part of this next chapter. We will open the um, applications and keep it open for about a week, and if, if what happened last time will happen again, we had uh, about a 1,000 applicants in a minute, <laughs> and so um, Spotify helped us screen, and then we, as the Berkeley group, chose the recipients. It was extraordinary. Hello. I'll keep mine very brief because I do want to make sure that we have time for a Q&A. Um, if you have a look at SCED or SHED, whichever way you announce, uh, pronounce it, um, if you look at our profiles, we've got links there for you to have a look at some of the articles or information that we've just given. Um, I will just play very briefly our intro videos for Women Produce Music. We have launched an initiative called InCollab and it has received... Pro um, has received a PRS Foundation seed funding to pilot a series which brings together pioneering, established and emerging artists and producers to work together on an album. We film the process, we document interviews and we 
create little opportunities along the way for interviews and magazines and uh, talks and so on. And in that process, we have one rule, which is that at any point we can turn the camera off so that it's not intrusive to the recording session. And um, we don't deliberately talk about women in music, but obviously the aim is, is that during these conversations and interviews, it's just a very natural process where conversations tend to lead to our career progressions and whatever comes from that conversation will obviously be captured on video. And we also give final approval to everybody uh, without question. So nothing goes out without approval. And we will then be releasing a limited edition vinyl uh, release, a launch event where we have live performance, Q&A, making of playback, and we do it all over again in another city. And then the aim is, is that on one side of the vinyl will be all the original material and on the other side of the vinyl we'll um, send it out to five remixes so that each project will hopefully allow maybe 10 women to have access to the pioneer, pioneering artist and be credited alongside that pioneering artist and engineer. And through that process, we create a global network of women that are networked through professional practice, as opposed to a deliberate, you are a woman, so you should all be friends and you should all network and give each other opportunities because that's the way the world works. Going back to something you mentioned, Teresa, about that there should maybe perhaps be a better gender balance for uh, this conversation. Um, one of the things within CoLab we decided to do is to say that it, it will be women-led, so all the technical roles are uh, given to women, but the actual artistic roles and working with bands and recording bands and um, some of the um, training opportunities will come from men too, and our ambassadors that have come on board, A2IM, AIM, PRS and so on, uh, are obviously uh, mixed gender. and. Um, the aim of this is to pilot it in the UK. We will have our launch event at the end of September. We have time donated by Iconic Studios as well. And um, we are hoping that from this process that we, ten we will move the conversation forward. And it is to make sure that this happens in parallel with the panels, with the research that we do. So the data and the statistics gathering exercises and the conversations do need to continue, but in parallel we need to see that we are moving forward in do it through music. If, if, the, if music isn't part of the conversation, if music making isn't part of the conversation, if professional practice isn't part of the conversation, then we will see what we have seen in the past, a very, very, very slow progression. And one of the key things that I'm very interested in, and it, and it is to do with my age as well, that I've noticed that there is a blind spot between wanting to, the initiatives wanting to support the next generation, a lot of focus on the next generation, and a lot of focus on established, famous, successful women in music production. And there's a, there, there seems to be a, a, a blind spot to the fact that we have a pool of exceptional, exceptionally talented women, that if we are to accept that there were barriers, they're still there making music scratching away. So those opportunities really need to look at the pool of talent that we have that don't need 10 to 20 years to progress. They, they, they just need some bespoke support from those that actually do understand that they exist and maybe need slightly different support because they may have children, they may have families, or they may just be demotivated and they may just have some, some gaps in their skill set that we can actually help support and identify. So that's the project that we're doing and I'd like to just play a little video of our, it's a very few, few minutes.
Hi, this is Suzanne Chani, and I'd like to say a few words in regards to Katya Isakov's new women produced music initiative called In Collab. I have had a very long career in music technology and music production, and I'm grateful that I embraced the studio and electronic music early on. I was lucky because I found a way to independently produce the music that I wanted to make. I worked during the week for commercials, doing commercials and television and film work, sound design, and that gave me the financial freedom to produce my own recordings on the weekend. I worked very often with women engineers. Why? Because I felt that they were more sensitive to what I was looking for. I think women have been underrepresented in music and music production. They haven't had the visibility and they haven't had the confidence because of that to manifest the visions that they have. This is a big loss for everybody because we're missing this important voice in our music. So I'm very much behind this initiative that's going on with Katya. And uh, I would like to see this advance, just the participation of women in producing music so that we somehow start to uh, right the balance that hasn't righted itself for so long. We'll fix it in the mix. <laughs>
Oh, sorry. Yes. If anyone um, learns of or knows of any all-girl bands of color, um, I, I have to say that most of those bands that I've come across, other than Dara Puspita, who are obviously from Indonesia, are white. Um, you know, it's 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 not surprising given that there weren't a whole lot of um, African American rock musicians until Hendrix and um, Sly Stone. You know, there's, so this is sort of that part of that era. But if anybody ever hears of any, please let me know. Um, also, I didn't say anything about this, but you know, as, as you were talking, Teresa, I, I realized I should have like said because some people know that I wrote a book about uh, so the history of sound, sound recording studios called Chasing Sound. So I have this background of understanding the history of the studio and how few women were engineers or producers until like you know into the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. there were very few. So this, and, and I think what, what you're saying is, is true. There's just so many women are still looking at getting the chance to be able to be part of it. Even though it seems like there's so much attention given to women. Um, I have a son in his 30s who's sort of resentful of all the attention that are given to women. And he feels like boys of that era, the millennial boys, kind of got the short shrift because there's, at least in the US, a lot of attention given to, to girls. But um, there, there's, still, there's still the gender bias. I mean, it, it exists. And of course now, you know, gender fluidity makes things even more complicated. So anyway. Sure you don't have any questions? Well Um, sorry, I was checking. The I thought you were talking You're to the. First to sorry, can you can you just quickly run that by me yeah. again? Yeah, so I'm from uh, Christian Sound Norway. We have a, a special session for electronic mus musicians making music on their laptop, basically. And we have very few female applicants. And so we are discussing this uh, in our faculty how to increase uh, what we can do strategies. Well, if I can uh, rewind just a little bit and widen that discussion to, um, uh, we, in 2012, I think it was, at uh, ARP in San Francisco, we presented um, the findings of a six-year research exercise in looking at um, 505 UK uh, uh, music technology, music production courses, the recruitment st stats. Uh, and also in the States, um, we, we, we had more st statistics come in in the UK and we found that it, overall it was less than 10% that, uh, that uh, um, in terms of female recruitment. And, um, one, and we found that in probably about just under, I think it's 39 years now, all, this, all the data that we looked at it pretty much was the same throughout, and that access to the technology had not greatly impacted on uh, women entering the profession, recording and producing other people's work. But what we had seen uh, access to data, uh, access to the technology shifting, was that women that are singer-songwriters now had, and men now had access to this technology and were, so the numbers were increasing in self-producing. And so therefore, a lot of the courses are still geared towards encouraging um, uh, recruitment in those areas of, sound, of recording and producing other people's work. And that's where we found that the numbers were very low. Courses that encourage self-producing artists and recruited self-producing artists tended to find that there were more women because they understood that these courses would empower them to produce their own records. And through that, you then have access to, to help encourage and, uh, and uh, offer those students another career option and to use those skills not just to produce themselves, but actually start encouraging them to collaborate and start thinking about using those skills to produce and collaborate with others. Um, 
And so it, really one of the main outcomes of that research project was to look at the types of courses that you are offering, the titles that you use. Um, using the word tech can be problematic. Uh, using sound engineer can be problematic because um, there's two generations now that do not really differentiate between com uh, an electronic composer and the term producer. And um, obviously, you, you, you know, the literature that you send out, you don't have an opportunity to um, explain all of that and, and be confident that all that information will be read. And so therefore, um, I think just asking how can we get more women to, to uh, enrol on these courses without actually maybe getting a working group to conduct research will probably mean that you won't get that question answered very well. But if you put together a, a meaningful working group to actually do some research in your own local territory and start thinking about these sorts of things and these sorts of questions and, and have a commitment to answering that question. And also remembering that your vision of what the ideal course would be may not be the vision for women and so you need to talk to you know talk to women and start with the composers that you have on board and start with the performers that you have on board and see what would interest them um i imagine berkeley's probably got a higher rate than 10 percent yes so we are nearly 40 percent female in our institution but may I ask for a clarification you're, you're asking uh, about recruiting more women into an electronic music yeah, so program uh, as uh, like an undergraduate program or you're looking for performers can you tell me so we have like uh, we have different instruments and like one of our instruments is laptop yes so it's a performative uh, but it's a college uh, yeah it's a college yeah, undergraduate. okay so my advice is women need to see themselves in your program. So if they see themselves in your materials, on your website, if they see themselves on your faculty, if they see themselves in the alumni pool, if they see themselves, then they're going to say, that's a place for me. If on the other hand, they look and they see things that are not, then they will move along and maybe they'll come to us. And we'll share, we'll share. Just, just uh, there are many women you just have to do a tiny bit of research and through Skype and other means today, you don't have to necessarily have somebody next door, but you can have someone give a talk even, you know, over, over the network. Invite women as mentors and that will change things. If, if they are technical programs, and a lot of times in North America there are many technical programs about dealing mainly in it, it talks more about gear than art. And when you talk about art and people come from music schools, and that's why I think in you know, some of the programs that were based in, in, in music schools, in, starting in Europe in Tonemeister programs that Marta de Francisco is from here. Um, a lot of women, so equal numbers, Paris and Poland and other places. And one thing I have noticed since Marta has gone to McGill, because I went to McGill, I was the only woman in my class at the time, and there are more now. So I think it really, it does have to do with, with women being there. Me? Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, the, for your presentations. Um, I am a record producer and, and a tone master, but I, I was a young girl in South America and Colombia mm -hmm. wanting to do something with music and something with mathematics. And I couldn't find anything at that time in South America. But I was at the German school, so I, could, I found, found my way to the tone master course in Germany. I passed that course and then my life changed when I was invited to become one of the tone masters of Philips Classics, one of the three major labels. And I was the only woman producer of the three labels, yeah. Deutsche Grammophon, Philips, and Decca. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only me, one woman producer. Mm -hmm. And after, what after- are we talking about? What this is you? in, uh, I, I joined in 80, 85 mm -hmm. until 2000 indeed. So I was producing orchestras and producing great artists and so on uh, all over Europe with also in other parts of the world, but this was my job as a, as a producer. And then um, later uh, the changes of the recording industry led me to 
rethink what shall I do, what can I do? I became a mother and all that. And as a mother and a freelance producer in the classical domain, it didn't work if someone called me and said, can you come for 10 days to Warsaw next week? And I said, what do I do with my three-year-old child? So no, I couldn't do that. But then I was um, invited to um, apply to McGill University as a producer, as a professor. And that's what I did, and I teach there now. And what I want to say is that somehow the, uh, the example that all of us women in audio give can make a big difference because many people in many parts of the world now um, refer to, to me and to other of the women that they know have made, made it in the industry. And then they, they say, I, I want to emulate that. I want to be one like them. And if she could do it, I can do it myself too. So now I have, for instance, students in different parts of the world who are also teaching, for instance, they are producing and teaching, and they have students as well, men and women, who come maybe to us. So I see my grandchildren, practically, who are also women in audio, and it becomes much more normal and much more easy in, in a way. I never thought it was a, a big deal to be a woman in audio. I just needed to be good and you, you, you have to be the best. Yeah. That very clear, uh, it may, maybe more clear than if you were a man. But um, uh, I think the example that we all give is, is a very good thing because other young women, especially in, in developing countries, for instance, which I encounter all the time in South America and uh, especially, um, they are very discouraged to try and, try and go into audio but then they see some women there and they say, yes, I can do that. Especially if you want to combine a family life, for instance, with, uh, with what you do. One thing that I should just add that I didn't mention earlier is that you also need to look at your faculty. If you don't have any women on staff and the, any prospective student or parent that's looking at sending their child or their, 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 their children to, they're going to find that you possibly don't have anyone on staff, and um, some, 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 some. I, I have interviewed some uh, engineers, Tom Meister as well, that said it, it, it didn't really enter into it when they were recruited, and there weren't any women on staff. But now, now that she's in the profession and she's coming up to maybe her 15th year, and she's been very successful. She's very vocal about these things, but at the time it wasn't on her radar, but now she's seeing that you know, her colleagues, uh, you know, she has a handful of colleagues and that's it. And now, 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 now it's registering. Um, and so therefore we need to think about those things. Yeah, Paul Novotny <laughs> here from, uh, from Toronto. Uh, the um, institution that I teach at, Humber College, we, we, uh, I just wanted to share this with you. We have um, uh, artist in residence week and we have producer in residence week and um, one of the dialogues that we're hearing back from our students is that there is not really a balanced sort of representation of gender with regards to our guests that come to basically you know, give us that special advice uh, with, with artists. And so this might be a suggestion for your program too, is to implement, uh, you know, a policy with regard, not a policy necessarily, but a, a, a directive where what you want to do is you want to have artist in residence uh, and producer in residence and make sure there's gender balance with that so that that way there are role models for the, the student body. Uh, so that's an idea, um, and I know that uh, at our institution, one of the things that we've been struggling with um, our uh, our program leader, he's been uh, reaching out to Esperanza Spalding, uh, who is a a wonderful example of of uh, you know being an artist who is successful and being a bassist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's challenging with regards to finding artists who will come because they either want too much money for the ins for the institution or their schedule is such that they they can't accommodate. So, I came into your your talk a little bit late, but I'm just wondering if your initiative might be thinking about putting together a database of available uh, artists and producers who could actually then reach out to institutions specifically so that that way 
it's, it becomes really accessible for institutions to, to get these people in front of the student body. So that wasn't something we discussed, but I think you just flashed a laptop. Soundgirls.org. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah, one of, those, one of those women like emailed me because she'd seen some of my interviews that I'd done with producers, and I can't think of her name. I told you about her. Yes, just told you about her name. So that Soundgirls thing, is, I think that's been around for a while. Yeah. yeah. And okay, well, great. Nissim had a question. Nissim, Nissim. Oh, yeah. she, I've seen her hand up. Yeah. I, I just also have to say that Nissim is the reason I'm here, so thank you. <laughs> so she, she said, you, you must go. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if each member, excuse me, <clears throat> each member of the panel could share a story about a time either in production or potentially in academia when you were able to create a a creative opportunity or change a dynamic in the room because you are a woman? I think I do it every day because I think differently. So what I'm interpreting and, and my, my framing changes the, the conversation. I said I was the first female academic dean in the history of Berkeley College of Music. Many times for years, I was the only woman in the room. And so to, to walk in and have five departments and one institute and now have five departments and five institutes that place students around the city of Boston or in the world on stages at Lollapalooza, Oceaga, South by Southwest, like none of those things were happening. Um, I, I don't think about it as I'm doing this because I'm a woman, but I think it, I just bring me to the table. And I'm sorry, there is no appropriate time for a white middle-aged man to interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Bennett. But uh, just, like, just logistically, the final tour is uh, leaving outside 939 right now, and Carl is going to leave on time. So if you're booked for that, please be outside 939 right now, so you don't, you don't miss it. Uh, and I'm going to suggest we let this, because this is such a we let this run for maybe another 10 minutes and start the Ableton demo immediately afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I can, think I can make it quick. Um, I was president of the Audio Engineering Society, and when I started um, my time at McGill University as a woman and the only one in, in the room, I remember um, it was the last class to have to write a thesis, and somebody said, you should present this, and it, and it was then um, quite a long time ago in time delay composition compensation. And I was nervous about going to AES because I thought, woo, you know, this is, what is the society? And so because I was passionate about education and about what I was doing and what I was building, I had the confidence and, and moved on to do that. And I, um, the only other thing I'd say is I'm just really proud of all, all of the students I've had, men or women. And there was one student I had who was, um, um, transgendered once who um, taught me a lot about gender. As I never went around counting numbers, it just, I happened to think about it yesterday about Aspen and the numbers and going there this summer. But uh, th there are many sides to us and you know, in indigenous cultures, gender is, is the two spirits. And so I, I think there's a whole lot we need to get through in this world with, with genderism and racism and everything else. And I, I think just by, as you said, to bringing yourself to the table. So if I can say anything, I'm, I'm proud of having brought myself to the table and um, made that a non-issue where, where I've been. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, what I was doing in 1965 with my girlfriends and we just thought, hey, you know, why can't we? I mean, there was no, it wasn't a big deal. This is the thing that I f I'm really struggling with in studying this because it wasn't like, um, you know, girls to the front, you know, riot girl culture where it's like you're really, they had to do that because there was still this kind of, you know, guys getting in their face. But when we did it, we had a lot of men who were very supportive. Joe Walsh wrote my letter of recommendation to come to Berkeley because we played with the, the James gang at that time. And, you know, I've, um, I posted, <laughs> I'm going to my 50th high school reunion next month, and I posted, there was a picture of my band in the yearbook because we played for something called the computer dance. This picture is so revealing, because there's all these guys, hold this a second, they're all standing up looking at us like this. 
and there's one girl, and she's standing there like, <laughs> yeah. And I found out later that she was, re I, I didn't know her very well, but I found out from a mutual friend that she was kind of a, kind of a tough girl. She died and horribly young in a car accident. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was sort of the attitude. Guys were always sort of challenging. They'd be like, you know, but can they play? And we could you know, because we were serious. And then it would be like, oh, okay, you're cool. But I think that at that time, there was still this, like the, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I didn't say about these bands is, you know, they got such resistance from record companies who would say things like, well, we have a girl band on the label. Well, you have like 100 male bands. Why is one girl band all you want? Because it was still seen as this kind of novelty. So there was all of that pushback, and it really, it took a long time, and I think it still does. I, one of my best friends is Chrissy Hind. I grew up with her. And she is, you know, she had to sort of push through, um, you know, working with guys that would sort of dismiss her, you know, and she's, I mean, she's a great songwriter. She's a terrific performer. Um, she just keeps getting better. But when she was I, in, I think, the early years of The Pretenders, and when she had to take her girls on the road with her, you know, and she's, you know, um, I think I, the pregnancy thing is, is a huge issue for these women. Most of these bands broke up when these women started having children. Guys can be, become parents mm -hmm. and still go on the road, but women couldn't then. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still got to be difficult. You know, you've got to have a lot of money. You've got to have a lot of support to be able to take your family with you. And then, you know, there's the giving them enough attention, you know. I mean, you know, being a mother, when they're, especially when they're young, it's really important that you're with them. So... I don't know, that was a long digression, and I don't know if that works. did anything. Oh, but I do have to say this. I forgot to mention that this shirt I'm wearing is from one of the bands, which I didn't tell you about, the Ace of Cups. They started in San Francisco. They used to open for, you know, the Grateful Dead. They were on the same bill as all of these famous San Francisco acts. Uh, and they had the support of Ralph Gleason, who was one of the founders of Rolling Stone, Jan Wenner. Um, they were well known in the San Francisco area, but they never did a, an, a record. I mean, it was, there was a sort of CD put out of their work, um, compilation of various live recordings and other things. They recently went back in the studio, and there are all these, fa if, you, if you Google Ace of Cups, band, don't get the tarot card that, that comes up, but they're, they went back in the studio and they're working with all these people from all of these bands, you know, um, um, guys from the Grateful Dead, um, Taj Mahal, they're all guest performers on the, this two record set, and they recently performed in New York at two gigs, uh, and the, I think they're playing tonight in Santa Cruz somewhere. Mm -hmm. So these women are all in their 70s, in their late 70s, and they're playing together again, and they were just terrific. I mean... You know, somehow they made it through, but they had broken up originally in the 60s because they were having kids. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Um, Any other questions? You had a question back there, didn't you? Yeah, I think in the university generally, we're reaching better equity in terms of uh, faculty and, and leaders or deans and that kind of thing. Um, but I think it has to happen at every single level of the operation. When back in the 90s even, we were talking in production meetings where, where I taught that um, you know, hires were few and far between. We weren't gonna be able to hire a woman in every area. So we said, okay, well, you know, we're gonna have uh, women as teaching assistants. So in my sound course, I had you know one of my best women I said, okay, look, I want you to do this, and she rose to the occasion. So every time I had a guy come to me with a question, I said, well, look, I can't go in the studio with you right, right now, but you can go talk to her, and she can help you out. And she did. So there was this kind of way in which she could display her competence for not just the male students, but the female students, and there was a, a kind of role model at their level, at the student level, as opposed to faculty stuff. Uh, and the other thing that this occurs to me, and I think this maybe you know has to do with the kinds of programs that people get into in music and production, we don't have enough, even in my program, a, a first year level where everyone's expected to do production at some ki of some kind. Uh, I know one program that I taught where first year students all did a production program, so women and men were all mixed in, so that by the time someone came to make a decision whether they were going to go into the electronic music stream, they didn't have that leap of saying, oh, there's the technology, oh, I'm not a composer, oh, 
you know, there were so many barriers at that, but it's too late at that point to make that decision. But if everybody comes in first year, everyone's getting their hands dirty in some way and joining in and collaborating together, mix, mixing, making sure teams are mixed so we don't have guy groups and girl groups, but that there's, you know, so that it's kind of understood right from the get-go that this is the way it works here. Then things happen, second year level, third year level, the students are going into those programs because they, they feel that confidence, they've been given that opportunity or forced to. I don't know, so it, it happens at the curriculum level, it happens at every, every kind of level that, that we operate, not just making role models, but actually ex making expectations right down to the, the beginning. Thank you very much. So my, my, my final thoughts are uh, Google the, or go on Spotify to, to see the video of Evie Queen, that, that uh, recording session. If you are in London and you have the opportunity to work with the two residents who are residing there, Ramira Abraham or Taylor Pollock, hire them in a minute. If you're, uh, if you're in New York, look for Jeannie Montalvo. But, Aside from all of that, I'm so happy that you're at Berkeley. So please come back, and when you do, find me. Thank you, Dava. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think I think we're done. But thank you so much for coming, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to be at this conference and and meet all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to all our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya, for organizing this. You're just terrific. Thank you. So thank we you. have. Uh,
if you need to. It's, that was kind of low to start with. I, I was low. Do we agree for me? Okay, colleagues, if you'd like to rejoin us, uh, if those are still in conversation, feel free to repair to the lounge on the third floor um, because we're going to start the next session. Again, just in terms of the interest of the clock, this session is about 45 minutes and goes straight into the coffee break, which is also in this room. So basically, throughout the presentation, feel free to sort of grab coffee as, as we go. We can let those two things um, crossfade, I think, would be the appropriate uh, appropriate <laughs> idea. Um, so, but the most important thing is that people are ready to start the final let of sessions at 5 p.m. in 311, 411, 511. Tech people will, as before, be on hand a few minutes before so that people can start exactly on 5 o'clock and we can keep everything running exactly to time. S between 6.30 and 7, we have a very leisurely walk back to 1.60 whereupon dinner will be seven and the gig will be at eight in the same place we had lunch. So I'm really delighted to welcome our next guest um, because he is so busy. We played email back and forth for about two months <laughs> setting this, this up. And as I have learned from Americans, most people think Boston to New York is not a very long way. To me as a Brit, it seems like an, an ocean. Um, but... Uh, a lot of what you're going to see today, I actually saw a bit of a preview of here at Berkeley a few months back when, uh, sure. when Ben was here. And uh, I was so inspired by it that I drove home at a kind of literally illegal speed in order to try out the drum bus plug-in that, uh, <laughs> that I just found. All your drums sound better when you switch it on. It's great. Uh, but I don't know what Ben's going to cover today, but I'm extremely pleased that uh, we managed to get him for this conference. You're really in for a treat. So please welcome from Ableton, Ben Casey. Hi. Hey, really quickly, I just want to get a quick show of hands from you, because I imagine we probably have a lot of different people with radically different skill levels. How many of you already use Ableton Live in your music work? Awesome, cool. OK, so it's like a little more than half of you. Um, how many of you have used Push 2 before? Cool, OK, way, way fewer of you. This is good. Um, Link, this cool tech we made to sync things together and let electronic musicians play like normal band members with each other, cool. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is spend the 45 minutes that I've got um, going over a little bit about what, how live works and hopefully help some of you that maybe have never used it before feel a little more familiar and maybe get over some potential anxiety that some people have about trying out live. This view looks so different than every other DAW in the world, so it can be intimidating to people at first. Usually I just say, hey, hit tab, and it doesn't look so weird anymore. Um, but. <laughs> Hopefully I'll go over some of the basics of Live, um, talk about some of the new things that we've done in the past year with Live 10 and 10.1, um, touch on some of the stuff you can do with Push 2, our instrument to create music at the computer, and hopefully provide you guys with a little tiny peek at Max for Live and some of the other educational resources we've created. That's a lot to cover in 45 minutes, um, if, and still try to leave time for questions. So I'll try to do this in like 40 minutes and see if we can take five minutes of questions. Does that sound good? 
Awesome. Let me see if I can possibly do my what is live and why is it different in like five minutes so that those of you that use it all the time don't feel too bored by it. Um, <laughs> uh, live has these two primary views, which is I think what kind of differentiates it from some of the other music software in the world. There's this view that has a traditional timeline. Time moves from left to right, tracks are arranged vertically. Um, that's a profoundly great way to finish music in the studio. Um, however, there are a couple of use cases I personally think right at the very beginning of the music making process and right at the very end when you're ready to go perform it, where this particular timeline based metaphor that we've used for decades is a little limiting. And so live does have this other view called session view. Here in session view, uh, the Time is not really represented at all. We have these tracks arranged in columns. Uh, and in each of these columns, they're filled up with these colorful boxes we call clips <clears throat> that can contain anything from like a single note to an entire symphony. It doesn't really matter. They could be audio information. It could be MIDI information. Uh, and these can all be independently stopped and started from each other to create an arrangement in real time. Now, this can be useful during a live performance, because maybe in the live show, you don't know exactly how long the intro of the song should be. Maybe when we're playing it tonight, this particular evening, the intro should start out with a pad. Let me know if I'm too loud or too quiet. I don't want to, like, underwow you on the volume level. I also don't want to blow you out of here. Um, and maybe this is like the intro to the song, so it shouldn't play for four bars like it does on the record. It should play for like an indeterminate period of time until we're ready for the very first verse of the song. And maybe at whatever moment that is, when we're ready for the verse to drop in, uh, I can suddenly trigger some drums. And at the beginning of the next bar, those drums drop in and they start to play in time with whatever else is going on in my project. And this can also keep happening for as long as I want. It's just going to keep looping like this until my laptop battery dies or we all get bored and leave. Whatever comes first. And so uh, I can kind of start to create a song structure by just starting and stopping different elements. Now, these slots here, these clip slots that are already holding musical material, they... Uh, I could drag new content into them. I could open up my iTunes library and grab a song right out of it and drop it into Live. Live will automatically go through and analyze the song, figure out its initial starting point, the first beat of the first bar, figure out the tempo and the structure of the song, and change all of that to make it immediately conform to everything else I'm working on in my project. Um, or they can also be recording slots. If I create a new audio track here, let's just move this guy over to the end. I just hit record to arm it. Uh, now you'll notice instead of little stop boxes or little play symbols, I've got little record heads right here. So I can hit record and record a fairly boring recording of me talking on stage. Uh, oh, I don't have my input set up correctly. That was counterproductive. Um, in any case, I can quickly just record new audio into these clip slots. And I could work exactly the same way with MIDI, and I'll do that in a minute with push. I'm just going to start to record a series of different takes of different audio or MIDI information in here. And then those can, I can immediately start to stop and start and, uh, and sequence in real time. Now, that loop's probably getting really old really fast. However, they're, one of the fun things about using this view, I think for most people, this view makes a lot of sense for why you might want it on stage. The parts of your song on stage might be totally different than the way they're set up in the studio. What I think is so powerful about this is the way it works in the studio, because it allows me to think about my song without having to worry about the structure of the song at the beginning. Most people don't write a song by starting with the intro first. They get an idea for some chords that sound great together or a rhythm, and they're not necessarily even sure if they're writing the verse or the chorus yet. They just know they have a musical idea they like. Um, so I prefer to think of this space here as sort of the the brainstorming uh, view for me, that I can just experiment with ideas and see how things fit together and see how they sound together without kind of having to commit to the structure and how long the song is and when the verse starts and whether there's a bridge and how long the bridge is. Um, I can do all that later. In fact, I can create that out of the material here really quickly just by recording things from my session view right into my arrangement view. So if I come over here to the arrangement view and I select this and delete it, and come back to my session view, I can populate the arrangement view just by a, making a quick performance out of these. So if I hit record here at the top, now anything I do in this view, 
uh, will automatically get recorded into the other view. By the way, if you want a lot of things to happen really rapidly, it would be a nightmare if you had to like click across the screen at lightning speed before the next bar came around. And that's where these rows come into play. We call each of these rows a scene, and those scenes have their own little launch button. And when I fire them off, it's going to launch everything in the row, including triggering whatever stop buttons might be here to stop things happening on other tracks. So for example, if I click this first scene, these drums and bass start to play. And uh, because I'm recording, I can jump over to the arrangement view, and you can see this is getting written into the arrangement in real time. And when I decide verse one should start, a barley, um, I trigger that, and we can see that melody is now being written into the, the timeline the same way the drums were. Maybe I want to bring in this bit. Uh, maybe I want to trigger this other scene that just has a quick key change in it. Maybe I want some kind of a bridge. And I'm just going to run out of time in my timeline there. So let's just put that back. I had a loop set up. So now that I have this here arranged in my, t my arrangement view, I can use a timeline for what it's really good for, getting a little more analytical, making some critical decisions about what I have here. Do I like this? Do I want to keep it? Um, do I want to have one thing that just happens for a single moment in this song before I, uh, before I move on to the next to kind of break up some of the blockiness of things are starting and things are stopping and things are starting and things are stopping? Um, I kind of think a little bit, like I, I always remember this old quote that like for artists should write drunk and edit sober. And I kind of feel like I'm not encouraging any of you to drink necessarily, but that's sort of what I feel like these two views are for. This is a fantastic view to just sort of create in a really free way. And then this is a fantastic view to be able to go back and kind of codify that and make those editing decisions and make commitments to what you want in your work to sound like. Um, that's pretty much how you use Ableton Live, for those of you that have never used it before. And I think I just about hit my five minute mark on that. Did that work? Is there any questions about the stuff I showed you really fast before I dive into like the stuff that's unique? Oh, I almost forgot. This is one thing that will confuse you if you've never encountered it before. So it's a really good thing to cover. Um, Live has the ability to play different stuff from each of these views at the same time. And this can definitely trip people up if they're not used to live. So for example, right now, all these clips here in the arrangement view are grayed out because they're not actually active. What is active is the stuff that I played over here. If I push this button right here, this back to arrangement button, we'll see all that stuff now looks nice and high lit and active. And when I hit play here, I'm going to hear what we performed the first time through. The thing is, while I'm listening to this, I can decide to change my mind, and I can explore different and alternative arrangements of the song. So while this is playing, I can say, hey, maybe I want to hear my, my arrangement with a different drum beat in it. I can come over here and launch a different clip from Session View. Now if we look at Arrangement View, here in the Arrangement View, only the drums are grayed out. They're disabled because they're being overridden by what I'm doing here in the Session View. From here, I can make up my mind and decide to either, hey, I love this other drum break, let's hit record and start to right over top of what's already in the arrangement. Or I can say, oh no, that was a terrible idea, let's go back to what we planned ahead of time. But you sort of have that freedom, and this can work for one track, it can work for all the tracks. So that's sort of the idea. That's the last bit I should cover to make sure you're not confused if you go home and try to grab the demo of live and get started. Cool, awesome. Let's move on to some of the fun, unique, interesting stuff. Um, so one of our big focuses at Ableton is this idea that people have increasingly less and less time to work on music. And so we don't want to make the process of writing a song easy. If you take away the, uh, if you take away people's agency, you also sort of take away the joy that comes from making music. Writing a great song is hard work. If there's just a magic button you can push that writes the song for you, you get bored of that really fast. It's really cool for the first three hours, and then you're like, I think I'll go for a jog or like maybe play a video game or something. That was, that was amusing. Um, we think that part of why people like making music is because it's a craft, and it's a skill, and it's a chance for you to grow and develop your, your abilities. However, 
We also think that technology doesn't need to be unnecessarily complex. When people get into a flow state, um, that's usually when they're losing track of time and they're getting their best work done because they're really in the moment. And so we would like to focus on how we can help our product keep people in that moment and make more music more quickly. Session view is a little bit of that process. This idea that when you write music in session view, you really don't need to hit the stop button ever. The music starts to play, four hours suddenly pass, you don't really know where they went, but you've been listening to that drum groove and the bass line, and as that continues to play, you're slowly getting more and more closer and closer and in, deeper into the pocket, your timing's getting better, you're a little more focused on the, the, uh, the fundamentals of the song, um, and all of this sort of stop and start process of music making kind of breaks you out of that in a way we'd like to avoid. So let's look at some of the fun stuff. Um, we added a feature to Live 8, because live, uh, live wants all of your material to play in time with each other unless you intel it in intentionally tell it not to, we thought this was like a sensible default. Um, it seems a little weird to think that for years and years, the sensible default if you brought new material into a project was to play it wildly out of time with everything else you've been composing for the last six hours. Um, but that was the standard for 30 years. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, when you bring any new material into live, it does go through and look at the material, and it looks to see the transients within the material, and kind of evaluates that based on the time signature that you've told the told live the material is, um, and uses it to to do some time compression or expansion to make sure everything plays in time together. It also means you can wildly manipulate this stuff. So, for example, if I wanted to just come in and grab this beat and time shift it earlier or later, it's really, really fast to do that. And I don't end up with a chunk of silence. It just stretches out the material on either side to accommodate it. Um, but it also means I can do strange things like select and quantize audio. I can use exactly the same quantize command I'd use for my MIDI data to move all the MIDI onto the beat to do that to the audio. It'll go through and look at the transients, it'll see how far off the beat they are and just pull them right over to the beat if you want to. And you can also tell it to only do it a little bit so that you can keep some of your human feel to your music and not lose it. Um, but believe me, after you've been tracking a bad drummer for for four hours, it's really helpful to just be like, and that part's done, we can move on. Um, <laughs> so because it's evaluating the music and really wanting to understand it, understand the audio on a musical level, it also means I can do things like break that audio apart really quickly. If I right click on this and say slice to new MIDI track, Live will automatically, um, and it will even do this during playback. I don't have live playing at the moment, but I could do this in the middle of a live show while you're listening to things and the audio would never drop out. Uh, it's instantly taken that drum loop, put it on a new MIDI track, sliced it up and loaded into our drum rack, and mapped those across the pads. And I'm ready to start creating a new rhythm out of that. That's not super new. I mean, you've been able to slice audio up for decades on the MPC. Um, we decided with Live 9, we would up the stakes a little bit and allow you to extract the performance information out rather than the audio data. So in this case, if we convert drums to a new MIDI track, Live is going to take this loop that we've been listening to. Let's just hear the drums on their own for a second. And in real time, um, go through and at uh, first it kind of looks like the same thing happens. It makes a new track, it loads a, a drum rack onto it, only what it's done is taken the, created a new MIDI clip where it's gone through and found all of the kick snares, hats, and other percussion within the drum loop and transcribed it for me in real time. So I suddenly have a really, really lame sounding Roland 606 drum machine playing exactly the same beat that that drummer played in the studio, um, including all of the subtle timing. Like if I zoom in here, it's not quantized. If the drummer was a little ahead of the beat on the snares or a little behind the beat on the hats, I've captured that information and I can start to use it. So because of this, I can come over here to my, my drum racks and uh, drag any other drum sound I want on here. Maybe I want to get something that's, uh, oh, I don't know, a little edgier. Um, and we thought, you know, if you could do this with rhythm, you really ought to be able to do this with melody as well. So here's a Fender Rhodes. It was recorded right out of the line input of the Rhodes. So we just have the audio recording. And the process works exactly the same way. And again, you can do this during playback. I can convert harmony to a new MIDI track. Because this is a chord, I really want all the notes of the chord. Uh, there is also convert melody that's intended for monophonic instruments. So if you wanted to do this with a vocal or a bass line, that could be a really great approach. Um, 
Now in this case, again, it's created a new track. Um, because I said convert harmony, it's a melodic instrument, so. I just have my sort of simple electric piano sound on here. Um, and if we zoom in here, let's blow this up a little bit so you can see. What it's done is gone through and look at this and figure out what keys were pressed, how long they were held, when they were released, um, when they were pressed. And so I now have this kind of performance extracted out to make something new out of it. Now it's interesting, it's choosing to like perform the delay sound. There's a, an echo on the original material and it's chosen to create MIDI information for that echo. But it's really trying to keep to the spirit of what you're hearing. So I could do the same thing I did with the drums. I could throw a different instrument preset on this and have these electric piano played back by strings or a synthesizer or something else. Although I think what I'd like to do is just use one of the MIDI effects built into live, like the arpeggiator, uh, to take these chords and turn them into a, a quick melody. Maybe not the most inspired melody in the world, but at least a melody nonetheless. And so now what I have is a, a pretty much a completely new piece of music. It's based on the rhythmic ideas that were present in that drum loop and the harmonic ideas from that chord progression, but there's none of the source material in the result at all. I think this is super powerful for remixers, people who are being given stems and being asked to reinterpret it, but I think it's also really powerful for instrumentalists. If you've invested years of your life being an, amaz an amazing cellist, please play your cello. There's no need to be a bad piano player. You've invested years in your cello. Plug it in, mic it up, record your melodies in on the cello and extract that data out and be able to play any instrument you can imagine. Or capture your ideas whether you're in the studio or not. Like I. Uh, I will inevitably like get up to leave the studio to go get lunch and that change of scenery is exactly when I get a good idea. So I just pull my phone out and I start to hum or sing the melody or I beatbox the rhythm. I save that voice memo to Dropbox. When I get back to the studio, drop it into live and extract the data out. And I have the underlying performance to start to flesh out that really terrible phone recording into something that I might actually use in my work. Um, so yeah, convert harmony, convert melody, convert rhythm. Um, we're really interested in this ability to sort of look into the audio. Um, let me shift over. I'm going to open up a new project because I want to show you some of the new stuff we've done in Live 10. But along with that, I also want to show you Push. Does that sound good? Cool. Um, so let me just get this camera up here so you guys can see Push. Um, we feel like live is absolutely one of the best ways to make music at your computer. However, we also feel like there's some really valid reasons to want to step away from the computer once in a while. Um, Physical instruments have a long and rich history in the music making process. Uh, the computer is rel a relative newcomer and unfortunately for a lot of us, it's the centerpiece of our studio, but it's also our movie theater, our video game arcade, and where all of our friends and family are arguing about politics. And so it's really nice to sometimes get away from that for a little while and have a more focused way to make music. Um, we think that hardware can be super inspiring for people because of the limitations and the focus that it provides. However, there's a catch. I feel like hardware is often easier for people to start an idea, but it can be a really frustrating place to finish an idea that the last 20% of working on a song in hardware can be really vexing when you realize you have to dump each individual part of your analog drum machine into the tape and make sure they're all aligned. And uh, it's, that's not the joy-filled part of the process. So we focused with our first piece of hardware push on creating an instrument that electronic musicians could use to create rhythms, melodies, and harmonies, capture those ideas, tweak those sounds, mix them and create a song structure and do all of it without having to look at the computer. So I'm gonna do as much of this as I can with also without looking at the computer. I'll leave it up there so you guys can kind of see what's happening. Now Push doesn't make any sound on its own, it's powered by live. Um, but we've really focused on trying to make it an instrument that you can learn and use in its own right. So this is a totally empty live set here. Um, what I want to do first is just go over to my Browse button here, which is going to show me the same browser you have on the sidebar in Live, and let me access anything I can get to on the computer. So from right here, I could get to all of my drum sounds, my instruments, my effects, my Max for Live devices, my plugins, including all my third-party audio units, VST3, and, or VST and now VST3 in Live 10.1. Um, it's really fun to be able to load Max devices from right here and be able to do stuff with them. But anyway. Um, I'm going to start off in our collections, which is a new feature we added to Live 10 that lets you kind of pull all your favorite stuff from the library into one spot and tag it to be able to find those ideas later. Let me just make sure my cue level isn't too hot. As I roll over some of these drum kits and stuff, I'll get like a live preview of it so I can hear what this sounds like before I start to use it or load it into my project. Um, 
And I think what I want to do is I'm just going to load this drum kit up. And when I do that, push automatically sets itself up for percussion work and drum sequencing. So what I have right here, the 16 pads on the bottom allow me to control playback individual drum sounds. Um, right over here, these 16 pads allow me to set up and select a loop length and move through my loops. So I could select just my first loop, my second, my first bar, second bar. Maybe I want to focus in on just my third bar for a minute to tweak something in the third bar of the progression and then select all four bars and play through it. Um, and across the top here, I have 32 pads that we've used for step sequencing. So what these let you do is input notes in, in non-real time. Um, I could show you that, but what I really want to show you is this new feature we've added to Live 10 called Capture. We feel like a lot of times people's best ideas happen when they're not uh, when they're not recording. Something about that red record light being on changes the performance itself. I don't know if it's like the fish story of the one that got away, like the best take was that one before we hit record, but we're gonna find out because the idea is now in Live 10, any MIDI instruments that you play are constantly listening for whatever you perform. Uh, and you can recall and use that info anytime you want. So for example, my normal workflow in Live 9 would have been to load up a drum kit like this, listen to the sounds, and then maybe just try to play a beat and see if there's something that inspires me. Nine, I, if I like that, and that's what I want to work with, I would then have to like tap the tempo in and turn the metronome on and listen to the click and play that again exactly like I did, but in time with the click track. Um, in Live 10, I don't have to do any of that. Uh, there's a button right here in the user interface of Live that's the capture button, and there's also a shortcut for it here on push, which is that I just hold down record and push new. And when I do that, Live does a bunch of things for me. First of all, first of all, it automatically creates a new clip. It takes everything that it just heard and it puts it into the clip. But it doesn't just throw it into the clip wildly out of time again with everything else I'm working on. It looks at the material and tries to understand what I just played on a musical level. So it figures out what it thinks is the start of the pattern and it figures out what it thinks the tempo I was playing at is and it sets live to that. So even though this was a brand new session that was originally set to 120 beats per minute, it's now reading this material that I performed as being at 98.5. And my click track is in time with my, my playing. So rather than me having to play to the click, the click plays to me. I mean, I feel like the click is easily the least soulful member of the band. It's weird that all the songs we ever record start with the least soulful band member. Um, we added all these new features in Live 10 to allow you more control over the click. You can change the sound of it and the subdivision and all kinds of other fun things. But really, for me, capture is my favorite feature because it means I just never need to turn the click on. I turn it on for 10 seconds to verify that everything got captured and is playing in time. And then I turn it off again, and I never listen to it again for the rest of my process of making a piece of music. Um, so now that I have this rhythm, um, I might want to, there's a bunch of things I could do. Maybe I want to record some automation and change the sound of it. Um, I might want to come over to this hi-hat and, uh, and capture, like transpose it or do something like that. Um, I may want to add another element to it, like some keys. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say add a new track. And it's going to take me back to the browser. And from right here, I'm going to go back to my collections. And this time, I think I just want to add like a polyphonic instrument, like, like, uh, like a suitcase Rhodes. Perfect. Now, um, now what I have right here, in fact, let me turn this back up, but let me turn my drums down. I'm going to go to my mix view, and I can just turn the drums down for a minute so that it doesn't bother anybody too, too much. Now, I've loaded a road sound here, and because of that, uh, push has automatically set itself up to be played melodically. Um, we thought a lot about how what we could do with having 64 pads on a grid. Um, we actually thought really hard about whether or not a device even needed 64 pads on a grid. And the reason we decided to go with this is that it allows for way more complex and more interesting melodic playing that you'd get out of something like a 64 pad sampler. Um, 64, six, sorry, 16 pads. 16 pads is great for like banging out some drums, but when it comes time to create a chord, you have very few options to choose from. Um, 64 pads allow us to make something that's much more melodic. Here in 64 pad mode, um, at the moment, I happen to be in the key of C major. I can easily change that, but just so you can see how the notes are laid out here, each of these yellow dots. 
are the octave. Um, so those are all C. And I can play through the scale by just playing from left to right. Or by playing up in sets of three. And this is like C major is perfect if we're like scoring for Disney or Nickelodeon, but it's kind of, we, we can move on from that now. Uh, I'm going to come over to the scale button. And when I push scale, it allows me to control the way the, the notes are aligned here on push. Um, if I feel super comfortable playing push and I'd like all of the other notes of the scale, I can hit chromatic and suddenly I get all of my accidentals. I still see the notes of C major lit up here. Um, but in this mode, push is tuned in fourths exactly like a guitar. So if you just visualize this as a big guitar laying, laying flat on the table, each of these rows here is a string and each of these columns is a fret. So I would build my chords using exactly the same layout I would for a guitar. So like root note, root fifth, root fifth octave, root fifth octave third. Um, what I can also do is control the layout completely. So I can dial through a bunch of different scales that I may like to work in. Um, this could be something really trivial, like moving over to minor. Uh, it could be something like, like minor blues that lets me cheat and sound like I can shred no matter what I play. Um, or it could be a more exotic scale. We have a bunch of different, um, much more interesting scales hiding way out here in the end. That could be a fun kind of creative challenge. I've never tried to write in Pelog before, but I think I need to work on a, a techno track in Pelog just to try that out. Um, when I change the scale, if I go back to in key mode, this same sort of pad layout now plays within minor, the minor blues scale. So for example, so I'm still just playing up and down in sets of three, but again, I sound like I can shred. This is cheating. We will avoid minor blues for the rest of the demonstration, I promise. Um, around the screen, each of these soft buttons, there's a different key labeled there, and they're arranged in the circle of fifths. So there's a little bit of music theory baked right in here. So if I wanted to say maybe get out of C and come over here to E flat. I can now play exactly the same way I did in C in E flat. What I think is super interesting about this is for someone who's just getting started playing music, um, it is extremely powerful to instantly be able to play in any key, in any scale, and play any chord, and have the fingerings for all of those different chords be identical. So the layout here means that this, this first note, third note, and fifth note of the scale form my triad. And they'll play a triad anywhere that I play them. Um, if I decided I wanted to try out adding a seventh, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or maybe I want to add a nine, seven, eight, nine. So just like on a guitar, you learn to play that one open bar chord, and you move that bar chord up and down the neck, and you've learned to play all 12 chords of the scale. And it lets you quickly move on and explore more complex harmony and more complex melody, rather than worrying about playing like a really simple triad chord in every key and every scale. Uh, so we think that's really empowering for people. And I think it's really nice to just sort of have an instrument that can kind of grow as you grow. Um, as you progress musically, uh, you could start off in key. Uh, if you feel like you've mastered in key and you want to move on to chromatic, you can move on to chromatic. Uh, and kind of go back and forth, depending on what your needs are and your use cases are. This can also be a super great way to pull you out of your comfort zone. Someone who's never tried to compose in Hungarian minor, suddenly switching this so that the only notes available to them are Hungarian minor, forces them to think about music in a different way and approach their compositions in a different way. So let's just capture something along with what I've already got going here. Um, Let's turn those drums back up. I could use capture again and just play along with this. Like it's always listening to what I'm doing, so. coming in capture right here from push. I can also view my clip right here so I can see all of the notes I just captured. It's captured the last four bars and I want to dial that back a little bit.
My timing is not so great, so I'm gonna hit Quantize and just smack those to the bar real fast. And um, I wouldn't say this is like my most amusing melody ever, and I wouldn't really say these are the greatest sounding drums I've ever made, and I'm running out of time. So I wanna make these sound a lot better, a lot faster. Um, what I wanna do first is just kinda jump back to these drums and solo this for a second. Because um, I think I should show Drum Bus, that device that, uh, that Joe mentioned earlier. Drum Bus is a new effect that we added to Live 10. Um, if I just drag and drop it here, it's going to load up. And what Drum Bus is, is it's a, it's a tool designed to process dynamics. It's a little tuned for percussion, but don't, uh, don't be afraid to try this out on a load of other instruments. This sounds awesome on bass and guitar and vocals and all sorts of stuff. What Drum Bus does is it provides some analog saturation. Um, I have a drive control right here. And a little goes a long way. I also have some built-in compression. Um, I have a crunch control, and what crunch does is it adds some mid-range distortion. This can really thicken up your snare drum, but it can also make your hi-hats way too harsh. And so to counteract that, we have a dampening control to let you kind of dial back some of the high end that you might be introducing with the crunch control. We have a transient shaper right here that's a super quick one-knob transient shaper. Pull it this way, everything gets more, more punchy and more staccato. Pull it this way, and we'll emphasize the release and bring out the room tone. Go full John Bonham really quick. Um, we have a boom control. Now what this is, this is actually an excitable high pass filter. As I turn this up, this is the one that all the like incoming freshmen lose their minds over. Um, this is technically a resonant high pass filter running through an analog filter circuit. So it saturates the low end and creates a sustained tone. Now I can tune this wherever I want. Um, and this is really useful for all sorts of things. You could, you could tune this to the fundamental frequency of the song you're working on to kind of help s support the fundamental of the, the track. By the way, we even see the nearest note name right down here. And if I push this button, I'll quantize it to exactly that note value. Um, but you can also just tune it to whatever frequency really, really like shakes in the room on that evening so that during a live set, you put this on your drum track and all of the kicks in the room that night shake the room that night. And then you retune it to the next venue you perform in on the next night. You have a decay control here, so that if you don't want to go full, uh, full sustained 808, you can just add a nice thickening low end thump to your drums. And this is one single device. Just to compare this a little bit, I kind of don't want that much crunch. Just to compare this, let's just like, that's where we started. This is just like a single effect. So now that I've kind of beefed up the drums a little bit, uh, I'd like to add a little bit of variety to this, mul this melody we've been listening to. So let me jump over and solo that. And in this case, what I think I'd like to use to do this is a new effect that we've added called Echo. So I'm just going to pull that up here with Push. Echo is sort of a love story to some of our favorite um, analog delay devices in the world. And I shouldn't just say analog, because you know it can sound like a tape delay, but it can also sound like a, 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 a bucket brigade delay, or it can sound like a 80s hardware digital delay. But in any case, it's really a character-filled delay. We've used these same cytomic filter models that we've used in our operator synthesizer and our wavetable synthesizer, um, and brought them into an effect to help you add some grit and some character. So. Uh, so I have a time tunnel visualization here that I think can really help people sort of visualize what's happening within the delay device as I increase or decrease the feedback. And the feedback goes up to a wildly irresponsible 150%. Um, but there is a filter built in here to help tame the circuit back. So this goes from like zero to Portis head very, very rapidly if you're not careful. Um, we do have a modulation control built in here to help you go way beyond traditional time-based delay effects. You can do chorusing and flanging, um, phasing. Uh, there's also a character tab that helps you kind of change the characteristics of the device itself. You can add certain amounts of worn-out tape motor or worn-out tape to kind of get a bit more of a Boards of Canada. Um, ah, the lo-fi loop junkie. Um, or you can add some noise if you want to add some tapis back in. 
Um, and this can range from like tape hiss to like more mechanical motor noise from the tape machine, but it really just lets you adjust sort of the characteristic of this particular delay device. There's also a built-in ducker on the delay itself, so if I want to have uh, crazy over-the-top feedbacking delayed sound, but then every time a new note comes in, it just squashes the delay to make room for the note and then pop back up when it's done, I can do that. We have a, a reverb built into the circuit as well, which can really do a nice roll in space echo sort of impression. Um, and this can be both pre, post, or in the feedback path. So if you want to really get nuts, you can add this into the feedback path and let your, uh, let your sound get progressively more reverberant as you go. Let me open that filter up a little bit. And add just a little bit of drive. Um, again, when you turn this up too high, it drives in quite a pleasant way, I think. Okay, let's go ahead and bring the drums back in. Cool. So we've added some new stuff in Live 10 and 10.1 that I want to show, about, show you to you. First things first, um, in 10 we added a new wavetable synthesizer. It's the first new synth we've made at Ableton uh, since we released Operator, uh, I think in Live 7 back in 2007, a really long time ago. Um, wavetable is a really beautiful two oscillator wavetable synthesizer and we went out of our way to try to make a user interface that would really encourage people to create their own sounds from scratch. So I can push this one button and wavetable can expand up to take over the whole view so that I can really see both of my wavetable oscillators, all of my modulators, the modulation matrix and those filters down here at the bottom. Um, there are a bunch of different wavetable uh, wavetables built in for you to use, and you can also add your own wavetables. So, uh, so I could work with what we have. Um, if I want to bring in something like a sample, uh, let's see here. Yeah, let's 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 make use of Whitney Houston today, right? If I can work Whitney Houston into this presentation, that would be perfect. Uh, I'm just going to take this first bit of Whitney Houston and just crop this down so that I have a little bit less to deal with. Uh, and let's put this into the wavetable synthesizer. This is much easier to do with one hand. There we go. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to take her over to the timeline here. Does this mic work? Does this mic work? No? Oh, hey, there we go. Cool. So now I just have a little bit of Whitney Houston here. Uh, I'm going to take my wavetable synthesizer and drop her in here. Uh, and what this is going to do is make a wavetable for me. Uh, so now I have So <laughs> uh, if I wanted to play through that wavetable from start to finish, the easiest way for me to probably do that is just to assign an envelope here to control that. The modulation matrix is pretty fast. All I have to do is touch any parameter here with the mouse and it shows right up here the modulation matrix. So if I add a little bit of envelope three here. So I can start to get really creative with this. This can be any audio that you have on your computer. It can also be wavetables designed for any other kind of synthesizer. So um, if you have a bunch of classic wavetables from the PPG left over that you want to import and go to town, uh, this does a really wonderful Prince impression. Uh, if you want to make some crazy hyper modern dance music, it'll, it'll take you there too. Um, there's a few things we've added to the arrangement view. We focused pretty hard on Live 10 on wanting to take the arrangement view and make it faster and smoother for people to work in. Um, let me just freeze this one track here because I just want some audio to work with here to show you. And I'm just going to flatten it so that we've got our drums printed here. Um, we worked hard on adding some, some features to speed up editing here in the arrangement view. So um, as I make selections up top here, exactly what I select up top is what I'm going to see down below to be able to do some quick detailed editing. But if I want to zoom in, we've added a whole bunch of new single key keyboard shortcuts to just zoom in right in on whatever material you might have here. 
um, and be able to dive into it and chop it up and then jump back out to higher zoom levels to see things see things from that perspective. Um, what I really want to do is show you some of our new automation features. So I'm just going to add an auto filter here to my drum track. Um, and I'm going to go into our new automation mode. You can just press this button here, but I prefer to use the A key keyboard shortcut. Um, and oh, the other option would be like if I wanted to edit this filter frequency, for example, I can just right click on it and say show me the automation. And I'll automatically go into automation mode and have that particular automation mode right here front and center. Um, in this case, what I'd like to do is create a little bit of a filter sweep. Um, I can just click in here and start to draw in filter envelopes if I want. I could record them from push if I want. Um, I could also record them directly from the UI here if I want. But what I'd like to show you is just our, one of the new automation editing tools we've created. So if I zoom in here, I can right click and I can just insert a, sh a preset shape. Um, this makes it really, really fast to create some shapes that would be really, really tedious to draw with the mouse or really arduous to try to record perfectly by hand. Um, I could duplicate that out a few times. Um, maybe what I really want to do is take this and make it get a little bit faster over time. So I'll just duplicate this for the whole duration of this drum loop here. But then what I think I want to do is make a selection here for the last eight bars. And I'm just going to use this transform handle to be able to shrink that down and make it shorter. So let's just crush that down to a single bar. Um, and we could duplicate it again, and maybe we do that again. We'll just build a faster and faster LFO here. Cool. Um, now that I have this, that's probably a little extreme for what I'm doing. I probably don't want to go all the way from open to all the way to closed. Uh, if I want to select this entire clip here, there are transform handles at the top at the bottom. I can reduce the, the vertical amount of the uh, LF, the automation, or the, the lower amount. I can also hold my option key and edit both sides at once. Uh, I can flip the phase right here if I like. There's also side corner transform handles here too. So if I grab this corner handle, I can increase uh, either just the maximum amount or minimum amount, or I can do both, again, both together. I can even fold it back on itself and create some automation shapes that just would be really tedious to try to draw by hand. Um, so now we've got a nice little... <laughs> For those of you that work in other pieces of software, you'll probably appreciate this one as well. Uh, Live for years has had the ability for you to export all of your tracks individually quickly. So if you're familiar with, say, another piece of software, but you'd like to start an idea in Live and then quickly move over to any other DAW, uh, I can come up to my export window, and right here in my export window, I can select things like maybe don't do a bounce of the stereo master, maybe just bounce all, each track individually in its own separate audio file, and I instantly have It'll instantly create, well, well, it will automatically create, I shouldn't say instantly, it may have to bounce out 128 tracks, who knows, but uh, it's gonna individually quickly create separate tracks for every single, separate files for every track I have in my arrangement, all the same length so that they quickly fi fly into any other piece of software. Um, and now in 10.1, we added this option to re include the return and master effects in the stems. So if like track three is a guitar take, but it really the tone of it depends on the, the reverb that you have on a return track, uh, if you turn this on, it's going to print that reverb right into the guitar stem itself so that when you send it to other people, they don't end up with a whole bunch of dry stems that sound nothing like they'd expect and then a separate, completely wet, reverb track of all the reverb for every different sound. They're going to end up with uh, separate stems for each part that each have the appropriate amount of reverb printed to that stem. It's pretty nice. Uh, we also added little things like MP3 export and the ability to export FLAC, which I think saves me a lot of space on this tiny hard drive that Mac seems to keep making them smaller. Uh, so, so this is really nice to be able to get kind of all the quality I get out of my WAV file without having to actually use up all the hard drive space on it. At this point, I pretty much only exclusively export out MP3s and FLACs and I do them at the same time. When they're both turned on, I hit, just hit export and I get both so that I have the MP3 to share with the world and I have the FLAC as my kind of archival format. Um, how am I doing on time? Perfect, okay. So, really, really quickly, before I totally run out of time, um, I should mention that um, we have a product called Max for Live. Um, we sort of adore the company Cycling 74. We adore them so much that we decided we would partner with them like 12 years ago and build Max into the heart of Ableton Live. So, um, what this means is that I have this whole section over here where um, I can load any of these audio or MIDI effects, these instruments, or these devices that control Ableton Live itself. 
Um, and I just drag and drop them right into the project and they load up and to most of our users they just feel just like any other device in Ableton Live. However, all of them have this edit button built into them that allows me to open that device up in the Max editor, peer behind this, the hood and edit and change that device itself. So suddenly I'm not, sorry, that's, Max always opens up with all the old stuff I was doing too. Um, so I can see not only not only do I work with this LFO, I have the ability to dive in and edit and change it. Um, and we work really hard to make sure all of our own devices are commented. Um, and this is a really powerful tool for us internally. I mean, a lot of the devices and the instruments I just showed you all started off their life like four years ago as internal Max patches that we could kind of test out and iterate and try new things rapidly in Max before we decided to turn over to C++ and design them with a little lower processing uh, processing resources, but it's great to be able to try things out fast. Um, I think this has been really powerful for live users. It suddenly means they have this DAW that's open and extensible, so if they have this idea to do something that there isn't any commercial software to do yet, they can make it happen themselves. Uh, if they want to create some kind of unique multi-channel spatialized work, but uh, they're building a unique array of speakers that's an, un an unusual number and configuration, they can create a Max-based panning tool to do that that's perfectly tailored to the type of environment they're working in. Um, maybe they're thinking about uh, wanting to create a composition based on climate information. Um, one of the nice things is that like, if this was purely Max, uh, we could build a tool that would reach out on the internet and grab weather data from dark sky and would try to sonify that. But using Max and Live together, it means that a lot of that work can already be done for them. They only really need to focus on the one part of their project that's super unique and special, that part that reaches out and grabs weather data and does something interesting with it. In terms of sonifying it, Live is already filled with instruments, synths, samplers, sounds, um, a mixing environment. So they don't have to worry about building any of that stuff in Max. They can just focus on that one part of their patch that's super special. Um, one that I sometimes like to show people is uh, there's a really, really talented Max developer in New York City named Adam Roxar. And Adam, uh, Adam really likes to play live, um, and he likes to improvise. Every single time he gets up and plays, the show is totally different. In fact, he like opens up his live template, selects all his clips and deletes them at the beginning of the show, and then performs the show from scratch with nothing prepared. He's got some sounds in mind, but none of his melodies are created ahead of time, and he, his performance is creating all of this information in front of people. Well, he wanted to bring video into this, but he didn't want to have to give up all that the improvisational nature of what he was doing. So rather than suddenly have to uh, sit down at Premiere and edit together a 45 minute video and then have to play to that every night. He sat down and developed this Max patch that lets him load a ton of different video clips. Let's see, today let's try cats and cars and push. Sure, it's an Ableton demo. I'll just drop these in here. Um, and we can just play what I was working with over here for a second. He takes this video window and he projects it. He puts it on a separate screen and projects it for the audience. Um, and what this does is listening, listens to the audio coming in. In this case, it's listening to my drum track. And based on things happening in the drum track, it randomly selects different videos and cuts between them. So that as he's performing, his performance is improvised and the video that accompanies his performance is also improvised. Um, he, uh, this, uh, all of these knobs do many various different intense uh, extremely psychedelic effects that can be connected to the music, it can be connected to the timing, uh, it, could just, it could just add modulation data to it. Um, this one I think is especially weird. Um, and I love, I love to show this example, not necessarily because I think everybody wants psychedelic video trash in all of their live shows, but, but because I think that this is like one of those beautiful examples of what Max is really good for. Um, Adam wanted to do something that didn't exist. There like wasn't a piece of software to solve his particular musical problem. Live already did like 98% of what he wanted musically, but he was able to sit down and do some development and create his own sort of extension to live to make it the instrument that he needed for his particular way of playing, his type of composing. Um, for those of you that are interested, I know some of us are, some of your departments are like sort of connected to um, other sort of tech departments. We, we love the idea that Max can help live tie into the rest of the world. So we did create this video just to sort of show off, I don't, don't want this to be too loud. Uh, 
show off using Max to connect live to the world of physical computing. So um, this was a really, really fun day at the office. Um, we were able to connect live up to a bunch of servo motors to drive servo motors with MIDI information, um, to read visual data from a, an eyesight camera. So we're tracking the golf ball. Um, here we're tracking the electrical voltage from a photoreactive sensor and using it to control the, the EQ. Um, bring in OSC data. This dog comes to work every day uh, at the office in Berlin and does a great job of playing the Leap Motion IR sensor. Um, this one bit doesn't work anymore because Vine is gone, but this used to be a really fun way to pull videos from the internet down off of Vine and be able to use them in your compositions. Um, but there are tons of other APIs. Oh yeah, you can control Lego Mindstorms, so if you really need a dancing robot, you can power that straight out of Ableton Live. Um, and here we use the banana and an Arduino to read the, react the capacity of the banana. Uh, oh, and little bits right there at the end. So we put this out. Whoop. We made this available for free, and I think it's a really, really powerful way to get, uh, to get young people, and really all people, interested in how uh, technology can make music accessible in different ways for different people. Um, there's one other thing I want to mention before I totally run out of time, and I'm lying to you, it's really two, but I just want to throw up here the Learning Music site. I don't know how many of you have seen learningmusic.ableton.com. This is a free product that we released two years ago, um, and it was one of the first products that we released that had like a much bigger set of web traffic than any of our software releases ever do. What Learning Music is, is it's a, an online learning platform to discover at a really elementary level um, the different parts of music making. Uh, there comes a point where making a piece of software that sounds great doesn't necessarily help people make great sounding stuff with it. And often music theory is, a, uh, if it's done the right way, can be one of the missing components in that, that picture for people. So. Uh, what learningmusic.ableton.com is all about is it's giving kids and, and adults a chance to explore music making and kind of understand some learning different musical concepts quickly online. So we introduce you to the, uh, let's get started, we'll start at the beginning. We introduce you to this ability to combine different musical elements together just by stopping and starting them. looks kind of familiar. Um, once you get used to this idea of being able to combine different elements together, we move on and talk to you about creating rhythms. And this is a working step, step sequencer here in the browser. Um, if, if the students create something they like, they can press export to live and immediately download a live set from the web with whatever they've created here to be able to take that to the next level. We go on and introduce people to what these different sounds are. Like what, what, what is a kick drum? <laughs> what is a snare drum? How do we tend to use these in a composition? Um, and this gets pretty deep. This goes all the way through kind of introducing you to notes and scales, introducing you to the concept of major and minor scales. Um, we go over bass lines, chords, melodies. We look at some common melodic structures. So uh, some of them are probably age appropriate and some of them maybe are not as relevant to, to kids in elementary school. But, uh, but we think it's really interesting to be able to introduce people to the melody itself and then see how you might program and work with that. Um, we've got some definitely some of our personal favorites in here. I don't know how many high school kids are really into Tour de France today, but. Uh, um, but yeah, we can talk about song structure. Uh, we have a playground here where, where users can just dive in and start to create their own ideas. They can sequence their own rhythms, create their own melodies and bass lines. And again, if they like what they're doing on the browser, this can all get downloaded and kind of developed into finished compositions in live. This is really exciting to us. This is a bunch of JavaScript audio. And uh, because it runs in the browser, it means it runs on mobile devices, it runs on Chromebooks. It's available and accessible to people that maybe don't have access to a Mac or a PC um, and don't have access to Ableton and live. So I think this is a really helpful resource. Um, this is definitely something we're planning to expand. Uh, there's, I think there's a lot of other topics we can cover here in the browser and teach in a really interesting and accessible way. I don't know if any of you have seen this before or used this in your own practice. Um, the, one of the main people, not the only person, but one of the main people who clearly loves Gray uh, is Dennis DeSantis, who also wrote this book, Making Music, 74 Strategies for Creative Composition. Uh, I absolutely adore this book. What, it, what Dennis decided to do was sit down and look at, um, and I'll have this upstairs later if you want to check it out. He decided to look at the, uh, 
common pitfalls that occur to people in the process of creating a song, and then present really clear, practical steps you can try to take to overcome them. Um, it's really empowering. It's split up into beginning, progressing, and finishing a song. And at least for me, I think it's amazing to see like all 74 of these different issues legitimized. This idea that, uh, that anyone who's kind of struggling to finish work or is kind of dealing with the anxiety and, and imposter syndrome and self-doubt that comes with being an artist uh, can read through this book and say, wow, I don't have the other 72 problems. I'm like way better off than I thought. This is awesome. Um, but he presents them in a very uh, tool agnostic way. You could use the contents of the book to progress as an artist no matter what your, your kind of platform or tools of choice are. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. It's sort of the opposite of the oblique strategies. Rather than having these really oblique, random possible ways to move your creativity forward, they're really concrete. Hey, having a really big problem with arranging your song, you get everything right to the point where you're gonna arrange it and that's when you give up and decide you can't work on this for another moment. Here are some concrete steps, steps to help make the arrangement process less painful and more fun and get more work done more quickly. Um, I think that's probably all the time I have. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you. There's way more than I could possibly cover. We're going to head up to the fifth floor, so if you want to ask questions. Are you here for the rest of today? I'm here for the rest of today, although I have to leave like tonight, so I won't be here tomorrow. Terrific. Thank you. So thanks, everyone. Um, I know it's been a very intense day, and it's not over yet. So uh, we've got a, just a couple of minutes in here to recharge coffee, take a comfort break, and so on. And as I was saying before, let's really make sure that we start all the final lot of sessions at exactly 5, so that we finish at 6.30, half an hour of leisurely walk, and then dinner at 1.60 at 7 p.m. OK, so see you at 5 for the next lot of sessions. Thanks again, Ben. Terrific. Thank you.